Today I'm going to be riding on Britain's worst high speed train, the often criticised GWR IET. I will be riding the full length of the Great Western Railway, from peaceful Penzance in Cornwall all the way up to London, the bustling capital. With the incredible scenery along the coast and through the heart of England's countryside, I'll be reviewing the first class offering on these trains, from the reclining seats to the onboard food and drink, and even the exclusive first class lounge. So join me as I see if first class is worth the upgrade on GWR's controversial high speed train. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm here at the end of the line in Penzance, Cornwall, where I'm going to be travelling with GWR on board one of their Hitachi trains all the way up to London Paddington in first class. Now this journey promises fantastic views so I'm really looking forward to the scenery and the first class experience on GWR. Let's go! Today's journey starts from the town of Penzance, with its terminal station sitting on the edge of Mounts Bay. Penzance is the end of the line for various routes, such as the Great Western Main Line from London and the cross country route from Scotland and the north of England. The station's only form of catering is this trailer cafe, though at the station you're not far from the town centre should you want something else. You can also get a free walking tour of the town on Sunday mornings, in either English or German. Anyway, let's head inside the station and have a look around. Penzance has just four platforms, which given the frequency of traffic here is plenty enough. Three of these are located under the station's roof, which dates back to the 1980s. The last platform is found just next to the building, adjacent to the car park. Back under the main roof, you can find a selection of artwork on the walls, inspired by local wildlife and scenery. There is also a really nice mosaic here. Being a terminus station, the trains spend a lot of time in the platforms here, usually leaving their engines idling while awaiting departure. Huh, ironic. For facilities, you can find a staffed ticket office. Next to it, there's a small waiting room with a cafe, however the latter was closed today. Lastly, there's the Night Riviera Sleeper Lounge, which caters to passengers arriving and departing on the overnight luxury train, which I'll have a video on soon. Subscribe so you don't miss it. This facility can also be used by passengers with first class tickets on regular GWR trains. The lounge is a peaceful and comfortable place to wait for the train, also featuring a good view of the platforms. There is also a small selection of drinks and snacks on offer, including some of these lovely biscuits. A hot drinks machine is available too. Showers are also available, but my absolute favourite feature has to be this replica nameplate which resembles one of those fitted to GWR's older Class 43 locomotives. My train today will be one of these 9 car Class 800 units, built by Hitachi in Northern England. These trains have attracted a lot of criticism since they entered service in 2017. The biggest ones have been the terrible seating, the rough ride, bright interior lights and a lack of a buffet car. But will first class do much to alleviate any of these concerns? Well, I'm about to find out. First class is located at the front of this 9 car train today, but this can change depending on the train's formation. As you can see, the railway here in the southwest is not electrified, so our train will be using diesel power until Newbury. From there, we will run on electric power. So, I think it's time to find my reserved seat. These trains do not have level boarding, in fact quite the opposite with a very large step up. First class is in a 2 plus 1 layout with a mix of mostly bays of 4 and single seats. For some reason, I had been reserved in a bay of 4, which I'd likely be sharing with others. So I decided to take this empty single seat, Coach K, seat 41. Today's route will see us heading east across the entire length of the Great Western Railway route. We'll travel along the famous Dawlish Seawall and on the busy commuter lines to London's Paddington Station. The journey is scheduled to take 5 hours and 14 minutes to cover the 304 miles or about 489 kilometres. 
we depart Penzance on time, at 10.15. Visible when we leave the town is St Michael's Mount, a tidal island featuring a castle, accessible by foot during low tide. Soon after, we pass Long Rock Depot, a light maintenance facility for all trains that come this far west. Only seven minutes later, we arrive at our first stop, St Earth. This is the interchange station for the branch line to picturesque and quaint St Ives. After this, we're out in the countryside, with rolling hills just like these a staple for much of the trip to London. So, with the seating being such a common complaint in standard class, I wanted to see if it was any better in first class. Well, they are certainly better, however the padding was pretty limited, and the seat had an uncomfortable shape. There's also an adjustable head cushion, which was actually padded. To start, these seats have a really uncomfortable posture, being bolt upright. Thankfully, there's a very good recline feature, which lets you recline the seat back to a more normal posture. Between each seat, you can find an adjustable armrest. And you'll also find two power sockets per seat, in the form of a UK 3-pin design and a USB socket. At first glance, legroom looks to be really generous. And it is. However, the table leg really gets in the way of your own leg, especially when you've reclined. The large table is a great idea, but I really wish they found a better way to support it. Overall, I'm left feeling disappointed with the seat in first class. Whilst by no means is it an uncomfortable seat, it's certainly not comfortable either. It's especially disappointing when you remember the trains that used to run on this route had huge leather armchairs. Briefly turning our attention to outside the train, we're now approaching Truro. This is the only city in Cornwall, and acts as the county's capital. The station in the city also sees trains on the branch line to Falmouth, which is a university town and hosts Cornwall's largest port. First class on GWR trains to and from London includes complimentary refreshments. I went for a hot chocolate and one of these really nice ginger biscuits. One thing to remember when travelling with GWR is that proper meals are not available on most trains. However, the offer is more substantial than just biscuits and drinks, but we'll get to that a little later on. The scenery down in Cornwall is pleasant and picturesque, with rolling hills, fields and forests being the main sights. Cornwall also has plenty of railway heritage, with Bodmin Parkway Station connecting to the Bodmin and Wenford Railway, a heritage line focusing on preservation of trains that used to operate in the region. Meanwhile, St Germans has converted old rail carriages that you can spend a night in. After 1 hour and 45 minutes, our time in Cornwall is coming to an end, as we pass through Saltash, the last station in the county. Immediately after, we cross the Royal Albert Bridge over the River Tamar, bridging the gap to Devon. The marvel of 1850s engineering was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, known for many incredible infrastructure projects on the original Great Western Railway. Its construction lasted five years, and once complete, opened up rail travel into Cornwall. This single track bridge, with movement restricted to just 15 miles an hour, was the only fixed link from Plymouth to Cornwall for over 100 years, until 1962 saw the opening of the adjacent Tamar Bridge for road traffic. And with the bridge behind us, welcome to Devon. We are soon approaching the best scenery on today's route, but first, we make a stop in Plymouth. Before we get there, let's also go for a look around the rest of the train. First up, you have these bike racks and luggage storage cupboards. I don't take my bike on the train, but I'm told that fitting a bike in one of these is an absolute nightmare. 
Many toilets can be found throughout the train, with a wheelchair accessible toilet found at each end. The soap was working fine, but the water was pretty difficult to get going due to a poorly located sensor. Once activated, it does tend to spray everywhere, hence the wet floor. There's also a hand dryer, so overall this was a clean and working toilet. And while we're here, let's take a quick look at standard class. From my past experience, I can tell you this is a horrible way to travel, with a bright colour scheme and uncomfortable seats. I'd love to go into more detail, but all you need to know is, part of the seat base is actually made of metal. Back in first class, I was trying to connect to the Wi-Fi. However, it was broken on this train. Luggage space is an aspect where these trains struggle, with just a few small luggage stacks which quickly fill up early on in the journey. There are overhead luggage racks too, and these are very large for a UK train. Sadly, nobody seems to notice the ample space for bags between the seat backs. We are now in the heart of Devon's Hills, speeding towards the coast. This is the Teen Estuary, which we'll be running alongside for a little while. From just after Tynmouth Station, we meet the sea. When travelling on this part of the route, be sure to look out for people waving at the train, or maybe even taking a photo. The railway at Dawlish is often in the news for all the wrong reasons. In 2014, part of this section completely collapsed in a storm, leaving the tracks dangling above the ocean. Works to prevent this from happening again are still ongoing, nearly 10 years after the event. We are now on the approach to Exeter St David's. This city is the main hub of the local commuter network, with frequent service to Exmouth, Paynton, Barnstable and Oakhampton. Recently, Exeter has seen the construction of a large depot and office building, located right next to the platforms. It's also the home of one of the UK's largest and busiest level crossings, with six tracks over Station Road. From here, our journey speeds up a bit. For a start, our maximum speed is now around 110 miles an hour for much of the trip. We also make fewer stops, with just four more to go in the following two hours. After Exeter, the main course of the complimentary food offer is served, in the form of a carrot chutney sandwich. This was served with a chocolate biscuit and a cup of tea. Whilst this is a welcome upgrade on what GWI used to serve, I can't help being disappointed when other British operators on similar routes offer a proper dining service. However, a very limited number of trains have a luxury meal service for both classes, available as an extra cost. I've not tried this before, but I've heard it's very good. Let me know if you'd like me to give it a try. At Westbury, be sure to look out for the Breton White Horse, a figure that has existed in this place for hundreds of years, with the first recording in 1772. For the rest of the journey, you'll be enjoying farmland and hills, with the occasional river or canal. From Newbury, the engines switch off. Not to worry though, as the pantograph raises, with the train running on electric power for the small remaining part of the journey. It's not long before we're arriving at Reading, where we join the Great Western Main Line for the stretch into London. The tracks next to us lead to Bristol, Oxford and South Wales. Reading Station is probably the most modern on our route today, having had a major overhaul that finished in 2014. It was also electrified in 2018, which eventually led to the expansion of crossrail services through central London. 
After reading, we can finally run at our top speed of 125 miles an hour for the remaining half an hour or so. Now on to how much I paid for the ticket, and I really got a bargain here. Using my railcard discount of one third, I paid just £33 for this journey. As UK railways are unfortunately known for their high prices, this was actually a great deal. However, it's worth noting that this was purchased in a promotional sale, and without my railcard discount and the sale price, it would have been considerably more. As we approach England's capital and our destination today, the typical British weather of grey clouds and rain make an overdue appearance. By the way, these trains are really rough riding, and have some of the worst suspension I've ever encountered. This was especially noticeable at full speed, but the entire journey was bumpy. Passing by Royal Oak London Underground Station is a sure sign that we're in London, and just a few minutes away from Paddington. And sure enough, here we are, the beautiful London Paddington Station that first opened to passengers in 1838. Overall, I think GWR have a pretty mediocre first class offering, with an uninspiring and boring design, unimpressive seats, and a generally poor quality train. However, at the low price that I paid, I was pretty happy with the upgrade from their standard class, which is far worse. As always, let me know what you thought of GWR's first class on their new IET units, and for a look at the UK's first low-cost operator, Lumo, then click up here now.